Hello and welcome to an exclusive hour-long programme with me, Alex Belfield, talking to one of my favourite people, Jimmy Carr. How are you? I can't believe your luck. Yeah, I'm here. Um, good, really good. Christmas time, lovely. <laughs> God, I quite like Christmas. I like the whole sort of thing of going out and buying stuff and giving people presents and things. And you're also in the category where you can make money out of us, which is brilliant. <laughs> you often go on shows and people go, you've got a DVD out, it's just, just before Christmas, like that's a shock. But of course that's the time of year when most people buy these things. And I think the reason for it is partly for gifts partly because you know that between Christmas and New Year is the longest week of the year. It's extraordinary, isn't it? You go, yeah, end of Christmas dinner, you go, brilliant, I'll be back at work in eight, eight, is it eight days? What are, we, what are we doing? Eating nuts and watching TV. What, for eight days? Yeah. And that's all we're doing? Yeah. Weirdly, that is all we're doing. So, yeah, it's kind of, it's a great time of year for watch. I think you sell a lot after Christmas when people just go, I've got to watch something. And then they're fun things to watch with a family as well. I mean, not necessarily with the younger kids for mine or the grandparents, unless you've got an inheritance and you want to kind of push them over the edge a little bit. If they're easily shocked, a bit of a heart condition, stick on the extras on my DVD, they'll be gone. You're going to have to give me a second because I've left my piece of paper over the other side of the studio with the name of the DVD on it. It's very complicated. Um, Yeah, no, it's called um, uh, The Impossibility of Death in the Eyes of the Living. That sculpture by Damon Hurst, mine's called Comedian. (laughs) It's literally... Do you know what? Do you know why I call it comedian? You don't want to be messing with people's minds. They've got enough to be thinking about. People have got busy lives. They've got jobs. They've got their taxes due. They're they're driving to... uh, What? Should I have the lights on? Is there fog? It's icy this time of year. The kids, are they going to go to a good school? What's Jimmy Carr's DVD called? Comedian. I've kept it simple for you. You'd have to worry about it. Who's your audience? Because I watched the DVD and I love the last two as well. You're so smart and you give value for money. There's probably more gags in your show per minute. I think I do. I do about three a minute. It works out over the DVD. And the DVD is kind of edited down as well. So even more so than a live show, it's bang, 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 bang. But that's what I always liked about live shows. I always liked the idea of a comedy show being all killer, no filler. There's no chat. It's just bang, 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 doing gags and lots of stuff with the audience. Was that on your press release, by the way? All killer, no filler. All killer, no filler. I like that. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, that, that'd be originally a, a gangster rap term, um, which. But I mean, I, I know I've been out of the rap game for years now. I uh, I'm very uh, yeah. I'm like I'm like JC. Uh, JC. JC. What? Jesus Christ? No, Jimmy Carr. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's an easy mistake to make. We're both from the home county. You only got to see you to know that you're terribly smart and you're better than us. You're cleverer than us, and you look cleaner than all of us. I, I, Congratulations. I, I, none of that is true. I'm. I, I present myself uh, as well as I can. I think there is a phrase: you can't polish a turd. I disagree. <laughs> I feel that you can, and I feel that a man never looks any better than in a suit. I'm, I'm merely putting the best foot forward. So I always try and dress smartly, and I, I speak uh, in a way. I'm educated beyond my intellect. Is what I am. I'm not smarter than anyone. I'm, I'm a little bit. I, w- I was lucky enough to get a good education, um, and uh, and I think I, I kind of I, I wear it on my sleeve. So why don't you do a proper job then, if you're so clever? A proper job? Uh, I tried it for a while. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I like this kind of grift. Well, I, I mean, you know, it's all relative, though, isn't it? I mean, there's, you know, there'll be psychiatric nurses and plumbers listening to this, thinking I've got a proper job. Who is that? A DJ asking that question? <laughs> Sorry, a DJ. <laughs> I'm a stand-up, but I've got a proper job. You you're really are a chancer. Well, exactly, and you make the money and I don't. That's clear. By the way, we're dressed, as do George. Well, the thing about George Asda is you are only paying for the label. <laughs> you should get down peacocks, get yourself a bargain. <laughs> How do you think of all your stuff? Yeah, it's the frontal cortex, isn't it? Yeah, no, writing <laughs> jokes is an interesting one. I think if you write jokes, it's sort of like crossword puzzles. You see them everywhere once you get into that mindset. I'm constantly writing, so I write uh, every day. Uh, just note down a couple of things every day, little and often. And then eventually, at the end of that, you have an hour-long show. And so it's a different show every year as well, because I'm on tour now, you know, from August to August. I do a 12-month tour, 150 dates around the UK. That has to be different from the DVD. You can't have people buying your DVD for Christmas and then going to see you live and going, I've heard this? Because it's just, you, you can't do I've had that experience. It's not nice. And you're one of those comedians where you hear people passing on your jokes in the pub, so you couldn't really do the same show for ten years. It wouldn't work, would it? No, it's, that's the most gratifying thing. The nicest thing, actually, is when you when you stick around after a gig. I always stick around after the gigs if I possibly can to sign things and say hello to people because it just seems polite. I feel a bit like a, a sort of a country vicar after a wedding. <laughs> Lovely service. Oh, oh, nice to see you again. You sort of recognise people year on year. But the most pleasant people often tell me jokes. Often they'll tell me my jokes back. Well, like they'll tell me a joke from my first DVD. Like, you'll like this one. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I did like it. It's exactly my sense of humour, that. Thanks. <laughs> Something happened to me earlier, and I thought of you when it happened. I was stood at the tube station at King's Cross, and one of the guys who worked there, his buzzer went, and he said, VIP arriving platform four. So I thought, oh, I'll be a smart ass. And I said, why would a VIP be using the tube? And he looked at me and went, no, visually impaired person. As if I was a complete thicko. No, it's obviously not funny. All right, let's just play a piece of music. That that went down like a bomb, didn't it? Thanks. But it's the radio. What are you expecting? People are, prob- people are probably literally splitting their sides. I've uh, been laughing at you for the last five minutes. Why can't you laugh at one of my jokes? Uh, it sort of doesn't work like that, does it? It's sort of about funniness. All right, let's play a piece of music. Forget it. Should we play quite a depressing piece? We seem to have ended on sort of a low there. <laughs> So a visually impaired person gets off the tube. There's a lot funnier things that could happen Just in that let's scenario. let's play the music. All right. We're so. back on your favourite local radio station with Jimmy Carr, a man who is extremely funny and extremely outrageous at the same time, but I don't hear people saying you're Jim Davidson, Chubby Brown or the blessed Bernard Manning. I, I thought he was a terrible comedian, terrible timing, but obviously it's, you know, sad for family and friends um, when, when a fat man dies. Um... <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's a weird thing where I just think people get the fact that I'm joking and it's wordplay and I don't mean it. I think there's a big difference between comedians that sort of have a, an agenda of of kind of homophobia and racism as opposed to people that tell jokes about edgy subjects and talk about things. And I think people are quite capable of making that decision. I'm trying to be as close as I can be to the guy in the pub telling you a joke. You know you know when you've got friends joking about things and you'll often joke about stuff that's in the news that you know you maybe shouldn't joke about and you might even complain about if you saw it on the BBC. But in the pub, it's fine. And in a live comedy show, I think it's, it's great. Also, I think it depends on the arena. You know, the medium is the message. Isn't that the great Marshall McClellan uh, quote? God bless the Canadians. On the radio, there are certain jokes you can't tell. I've gone into trouble for telling jokes on the radio because people didn't ask to listen to me. They're listening to that local radio, that Jimmy Carr fella seems to be on. Well, I can't be bothered to change the station because I, I like the station, but I don't like him. And then if you tell a joke that's very offensive, they might be, you know, really upset. Whereas if it's a DVD or a live show, they've made a conscious decision it's, you, you have to take offence. I don't think you need to defend it with that. I think it's just, it's fine to talk about that stuff. And I, I think it's, um, I was talking the other day about um, sexual fantasies uh, on stage. We were, there's a bit in the new show that I'm touring, Repeat Offender, about sexual fantasies. And we were chatting about sexual fantasies and people were saying, well, I'd, I'd, I'd very much like, uh, you know, to do it here or do it there, a mile high club or, or you know, with two women at the same time, all that sort of stuff. And someone shouted out, standing up as their ultimate sexual fantasy. And I said, what, standing up? <laughs> what, what, are you in a wheelchair? And he, of course he was in a wheelchair. And it's th- those guys, guys with disabilities, guys that, you know, ha- have, have, you know, blind, deaf, d- whatever you've got going on, you know you've got it going on. The joke is not the thing. And I think often it's, it's people are offended on behalf of someone, which I can't think of anything more patronising. Mm. I would agree, absolutely. Your show isn't like a BMP rally. Having seen Bernard and Chubby and just interviewing Jim Davidson last week, it's interesting he now spends the first 40 minutes of his act explaining his act. It is interesting, though, having watched Ricky Gervais's brand new DVD, I don't quite understand how he gets away with it because he's basically laughing at all different minorities and groups and disabled people but because he's a character people seem to let him get away with it but actually it's equally as offensive I, I, I don't think he's getting away with anything I think he's yeah he's a great comedian he's really funny and you know he's clearly not a bigot I think it's just you know the big difference is your your perception of Bernard Manning uh, whether he was or not and I think he probably was was he was a bigot the perception of Jim Davidson uh, you know on that cookery show whatever it was was this man is actually seems to be a bit homophobic no one minds telling a joke about something but if you seem to if you mean that if there's a message behind that joke then that can be a very dangerous thing I would disagree with you slightly on the Jim Davidson thing with the programme. I'm not justifying his act, but I think he was set up on that show. And the way it was edited, if it was so offensive, why did they repeat it 40 times and make it last two nights? Why didn't they just delete it and kick him off? Uh, yeah, I can I can see. I mean, yeah, you can always dress that up, though, can't you? On a reality TV show, I think it's, yeah, the edit is important. But I've worked on TV shows with that kind of turnaround edit. There isn't time for that. They're well, ge- they're genuinely, it's not possible to do that. It's You basically, you, you have some stuff that happened that day and you show it that night. There isn't time to sit down and go, right, what stories are we telling here? Over Big Brother, there might be more of an opportunity because they've got a 24-hour edit and they're planning it weeks in advance. But on that kind of show, you know what? If you say something bigoted and you, you say it aggressively, calling someone a puff, let's say, uh, you could say, well, that's a homophobic, horrible thing. But it depends how you say it. 
Depends how you say it, depends who you say it to, depends how obviously, you know, um, gay friendly you are as an act and, and uh, uh, you know, depends what you follow it up with. And you're very gay friendly. I mean, they love you, don't they? I'm, I, was, I was asked last year to judge Mr. Gay UK. I said, no problem at all. He's against nature and against God. He's going to hell. <laughs> We're back on your favourite local radio station talking to Jimmy Carr. I love talking about comedy because I do think it's fascinating how you either justify your material or how you come up with your material. I try not to justify. I try to be very sort of clear on that. I've made the mistake a few times for apologising for a joke. It's a disastrous thing to do. I think what you're brilliant at is saying what we're thinking. You seem to work very hard on bringing it down to as few words as possible as well. My favourite joke at the moment is uh, venison's deer, isn't it? Four words. Come on, be that. Be that. I'm, I'm trying for three. My previous record was throwing acid is wrong in some people's eyes, which was a mighty seven words, which, strike, frankly, that's, that's a novella as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, I like keeping it pithy. I like it to be short and to the point and, and give, I have a lot of those ideas because that sort of sense of watching comedy, if you buy a DVD or whatever, you, you kind of, oh, I'm not so keen on that joke. Oh, there's another one. Oh, I like that one. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. Oh, the, you know, it's, and it also means you can watch it a few times. If you're spending 15 quid on a DVD, you want to be able to watch it a few times. Does that kind of work against you? Because when you've come up with something so brilliant that everybody wants to tell everybody else, you've then got to drop it because it's then not yours. It's everybody's. Yeah, I think once you put something on a DVD, I think that's it for you. That you're not going to tell those jokes again. Um, which I think is quite nice. I think it makes you write more stuff. And it used to be in the old days, you would come up with an act and you would never bother changing it because, you know, you could just tour it forever, you know, in the old days of music hall or whatever. And now you need to change it every year. And do I do a new show every year, a new tour show, and try and bring out a DVD every year. Um, you know, and it strikes me that that's a very interesting way to be. It keeps your mind going and it's fun. Are the opportunities for wordplay infinite? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a huge, huge language and there's so much you can do, so many playful things. And um, yeah, I think it's it's just endless, absolutely endless. That's only what I love about doing what I do. Sometimes people will come up and they'll say, I went up to the airport information desk. I said, how many airports are there in the world? Now, I, I've had people come up and go, I now whenever I travel and I see an airport information desk, I can't help but think of that. That's the joke that I, that I think. It's a lovely thing when you kind of, a situational joke. There are certain songs that I hear do you get this when if I'm traveling in London if I'm at Victoria Station I always sing the the the, the old kink song Victoria I was to Victoria as you're walking you know or if I'm on the tube late at night it's down in the tube station and you know it's always kind of that, those little things I like those little jokes that you just you carry with you Terminal Building always associates with a joke when I see that now from the old comedians that would do the joke I don't trust airports it's called the Terminal Building yeah. things like that how do you know though that it's funny you always I mean I do loads of shows in tiny little rooms just to test whether something's funny the interesting thing is 40 people in a, above a pub will know as well as 3,000 people what's funny and what isn't and sometimes as a comic you think oh that's going to be a brilliant joke it's nothing you got nothing uh, and sometimes something that you thought was inconsequential and you nearly didn't try is the best joke of the set it's, it's weird but the audience always knows best I love Bob Monkhouse for that. He was a great orator and also a great writer and loved his comedy and loved his wordplay. He said that a joke that he thought was brilliant, his local vet and taxidermist have gone into business together called Either Way You Get Your Dog Back, and it never got a laugh. But yeah. to him, it was his favourite joke because it was just so clever. Is the material that you write now that you wish you could put in but nobody else finds it funny? Yeah, there is, but often you go, I go back to stuff. Often I'll sort of write something that doesn't make the show, doesn't make the deadline, but then you'll look at it again six months later and go, oh, i tell you why it's kind of... Because uh, uh, there's a great analogy. Um, it's, it's not mine, actually. It's um, uh, Jerry Seinfeld said this in an interview. Jokes are... It's like getting someone to jump over a chasm, a joke, okay? And sometimes uh, the, the, the chasm is too narrow. It's like st you can just step across and there's no thrill. It's like, nah, yeah, I kind of knew where that was going. It's nothing fun. Uh, and sometimes it's too far. Sometimes you're asking, the leap is just too much and the chasm is too wide and they fall down and there's, there's nothing. It's too big a leap. And sometimes it's just right. You know, a joke is, it's, oh, okay, you have to make that leap and it's far enough and it's thrilling and exciting and we went on the journey with you. And that strikes me as kind of the best jokes. Sometimes, you know, in your writing, it's either not daring enough or too daring or there's too much of a logical leap or you've missed out a point. The sad thing about what you do is you can write all these clever jokes and then you go to the audience, as you did within the first 40 seconds of the DVD, and ask a lady a question and get a bigger laugh than your jokes. I think the thing with audience participation is that you should just, you know, it should be... 20% of the show every night. So that keeps you on your feet. It's the interesting bit for me, because I've heard the rest of it. If I'm doing the show 150 times, there's an element of me kind of, if the audience don't keep me on my toes, there's an element of kind of going through the motions. I don't want to go through the motions. I want, you know, I end the tour next August in Blackpool, and I want it to be as fresh. And what keeps it fresh is chatting to the audience and messing around. 
And what about those moments where you wish you'd have said something afterwards when you're in the car driving home thinking, oh, God, that would have been the line and you couldn't think of it then? Yeah, often you can turn that into a joke. Often those kind of... Um, uh, what are they? Uh, le spirit d'escalier is the French term, isn't it? Translates as, as you walk down the stairs. Because the, the French would typically have a restaurant on the first floor. And, and there was a sense in which, like at the end of a dinner of arguing and chatting, you would think of something just as you were walking down the stairs. Spirit d'escalier. It's a very nice, beautiful sort of term. Trust the French. They're very good like that. Um, spirit d'escalier. I'm going to make a note of that. Yeah, it's kind of nice. It's not a bit of local radio, but a bit of culture for you. Yeah, I lovely. I never thought I was going to learn anything off you today, but well, it's just brilliant. There you go. But no, often I think the best thing about being a comedian is the fact that in difficult situ- situations, awkward situations, or, you know, when you think, oh, I should have said that, you go, well, I can. I'll say it tomorrow. It'll just be a story. Done. <laughs> When someone heckles as well, you just think, you know what, that's not the last time I'm going to be heckled. We'll be back next on your favourite local radio station. We're going to talk about your childhood and what you were like as a kid. I was smaller. We're back on your favourite local radio station with Jimmy Carr today. I really enjoy your quiz shows. You are very clever at getting the funny bits in, but not taking over. There are some hosts of quiz shows that like to be the star. It's a difficult balance, isn't it? Especially with the type of shows you do with so many comedians Uh, around. Sorry, you lost me at uh, other other people that think they were the star. I I thought I was the star. I'm going to have to rethink my career. No, I think that, you know, when you're um, a host of a show, it's a very different thing. Like, I like being a panellist on QI or Have I Got News For You uh, on occasion. But really, when you're hosting a show, it's about, you know, creating an atmosphere where you, you know, get your funny in, but then let people get on with it and have a conversation and chat with people. It's a lot of fun. How difficult is it on those shows to get the right guests? Because there's one on BBC Two that I almost find unwatchable. It's as if all of the comedians are so desperate to be heard. They over-talk each other, and I can't stand that. And then they try and come back on each other's jokes. It can't be competitive, can it? I don't think it ever is competitive. I mean, I think that's to do with editing as well. I think, you know, often you get very good comics that are kind of edited or produced in a weird way. But no, I think it's, you know, you know, comedy shows like that, it tends to be, if you don't like the show, it's because it wasn't for you. You know, because it's oft- often the way is on TV, you go, oh, I didn't, I didn't enjoy that. That was rubbish. It wasn't rubbish. It just wasn't for you. Different sort of caper. We make another thing called the Big Fat Quiz of the Year, which is on around now. I think it's on in a couple of days, um, uh, which is great. We've got the goth detectives back. Uh, Russell Brand, Noel Fielding. Can't believe our luck. Uh, we've got uh, um, Rob Brydon doing it, uh, Jonathan Ross. I mean, it, you know, it's a really fun. I think it's great telly for Christmas because it's two hours and you can play along at home. I watched the celebration one for Channel 4 and it went on for about three days. How long do you actually record for? I think the final edit was about two hours, wasn't it? Oh, it's still going on. <laughs> that's still, that's still, I've just, I've nipped out to do this, but I, I have to go back and do a final link. Carol Vorderman was on that show. I think she had three surgeries in between, didn't she? It was remarkable. She did, yeah, she's amazing. There's a portrait of her getting older somewhere, isn't there? <laughs> She's extraordinary. And we showed a clip of her like, like when Channel 4 launched, because she was on the first day, and she looked better now. And you just think, <laughs> well, you're disobeying the space-time continuum. That seems out of order. And to think that she's so bright and with numbers and letters, I still fancy her. Uh, yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? I think a lot of people say that. I, li- I like her for her, her body, but also her mind. Well, they don't say that specifically. They tend to say, I'd like to... Which is a good idea, because it'd take your ages, wouldn't it? Value for money on that. Let's talk about you as a child. Were you as obnoxious as a character you are now? Thanks for that, yeah. Christ, there's no right answer to that. It's like, when did you stop beating your wife? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think I'm obnoxious. I just think I'm, I'm kind of barbed on stage. I tell jokes for a living. Um, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Because I don't come across as very likeable on stage, I, um, which is odd, because most comics do. But I just tell jokes and, and let those kind of speak for themselves. Where you are different, I don't get the impression that you're needy and you want to be loved. A lot of the comics that I've interviewed are... Thank are- God you said that. <laughs> I've been waiting for someone to say that and I just... <gasps> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not really desperate for people to like me. I'd like people to think I'm funny. Uh, but as long as they're willing to have sex with me, I don't... Really... Anybody. I'm fine. Take all comers. <laughs> The thing about your show, as I say, is the speed in which you deliver your gags. The question I have to ask is, how do you remember them all? Is it almost like an actor remembering lines in a play? Yeah, basically, it's kind of you remember them in little chunks. So you go, right, okay, I'm talking about diets and health and stuff. So I've got 12 jokes about that. And you vaguely remember what order they're in. And, you know, as the tour goes on, you get better at it. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, it's tough remembering jokes. Yeah. But someone's listening to this who's digging a ditch and he's working on Christmas Day. And, and pack, working as a Santa in a shopping mall and there's 50 kids on his lap and he's thinking, oh, gee, I'm 104 degrees under this beard. He's thinking, and you remember jokes, do you? Well done. Great, well done. As far as I'm aware, there's only Monkhouse, you and Doddy 
who seem to have the roller decks of gags where you say a word and you're right back there. There's Tim Vine as well. He's very good at that. It's a specific style. Were any of those of interest to you when you were growing up? Obviously not Tim Vine because he's in your generation. I, I'm less interested in those guys and more interested in people like Emo Phillips and Stephen Wright. I mean, I like Bob Mark Bunkhouse a lot. I think he's a, a very good performer. But really, you know, Stephen Wright, Emo Phillips were my favourites kind of growing up. They're one-liner guys, but they're slightly longer than just a one line. It's not just a silly joke. It seems to have a root in reality. I like that. Wright's got the most peculiar form of delivery as well. It's so slow, and Emo certainly has. You don't just want an old-fashioned gag man. Is that what I you're mean, saying? You know what? I'm a huge comedy fan. I mean, across the board, I like um, Ricky Gervais, I like Peter Kay, I like Ross Noble, I like Alan Carr, I like Jack D. I like Adara Breen. The, the list goes on. I'm a big comedy fan, but those are the guys that were very much an influence on my writing. Anybody here who inspired you when you were growing up? Um... Not, not somewhat, not in terms of writing. I mean, in terms of when I started writing jokes, I noticed that my style was not dissimilar to Stephen Wright and Nemo Phillips, and and really, you don't know what your style is until you start writing jokes, and then and then after you've done it, you kind of look at theirs and go, oh, that's how they've done that. That's kind of the structure, and kind of take the pieces and put it back together again. Well, hopefully, put it back together again. Were you always funny? Yeah. He said incredibly arrogantly. Hey, yeah, I, I don't, I don't. There's people listening to this that go, was he always funny? He's not funny now. What are you on, man? <laughs> It's a very personal thing. I mean, uh, you know, you, everyone's got a sense of humour and everyone's sense of humour is right, for want of a better word, you know. If you think you're funny, you are. If you think you're not, you're not. Having said that, though, there are those people in the pub who will make you laugh louder than others. There are those who you would want to be trapped in a lift with and those you wouldn't. Were very you personal the, choice, though, isn't it? It is. But were you at school one of those guys that people kind of like to crowd around to make them laugh? Everyone was funny at school. I can't remember anyone not being funny at school. Everyone was funny all the time. It's all we had to do. It's just, it, that's what kids do. They tell jokes to each other and mess around. Now, I saw you on Jonathan Ross the other week, and um, how do I describe this? I think we got to see you virtually naked. There was no need for that. I'm surprised there haven't been complaints to Ofcom. Um, well, I mean, I, 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 I've made an official complaint to the police. I feel violated. Uh, no, it's fine. We're mates. It's fine. You know, it's one of those things. <laughs> Occasionally, you know, you'll do a TV show, and you, maybe a friend, showbiz friend, uh, will undress you a little on, on the show and I think that's fine and I've got a feeling nobody will be able to relate to anything you've said in the last minute no you'll be fine <laughs> if you can relate to anything I've said in the last minute get help is it nice being accepted by the showbiz community do you worry about that yeah I think it, it means an awful lot but I, I don't you know I don't do it for the um, you know for other comics to think I'm cool there's a, they, you know, there's a lot of people that do. There's a lot of people that are, you know, too cool for school in comedy and, you know, playing tiny rooms, but they've got a great reputation and it's all about the kind of, you know, um, the credibility. I'm, I'm very populist. I want as many people to laugh as possible uh, without being mainstream. I mean, I've never really compromised what I do. It's interesting that I've kind of, um, I've sold out in a very interesting way. You know, I've, I've, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, big TV star, and that's great and really fun and lovely, and, and you know, I, I get on very well with those kind of showbiz people. Um, you know, I'm very good friends with 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 Jonathan, certainly. But it's it, that's not as important as you know, audiences coming, people buying the DVD, the members of the public. Like I like it when I win awards that are voted for by people. I know it's a terrible cliche, but really, you do think oh, that's pretty cool. Because someone's taking time out of their day not only to buy the DVD but vote for a thing. You think, well, that's pretty terrific. What always amazes me is when someone like you or anyone can make people leave their homes and pay for a ticket and get through the car park. A babysitter? Gee, I can't believe it. It's more expensive than the tickets, isn't it, these days? What, the babysitter? Of course. It depends what you do with her, but yes, can be. <laughs> and to fill theatres like you do so often, do you think about that, the effort that people have to put in yeah. to come and see you? Yeah, you really do. You think about it before the show. I think that's why you get nervous. I think if it was, you know, if it was a free show and everyone had just turned up because they happened to be there, you'd be much more. But you know, especially when you do a show and people have travelled four hundred miles, you know, because they couldn't get a ticket in Birmingham, so they drove to Carlisle to come and see, and you go, right, well, this better be good. It's part of the reason you wait around after the gig to say hello to people as well, because you just feel like, you know, it's always someone's big night. It's always someone's birthday or they're leaving do or they're a huge fan and they've watched the video a million times and they know everything backwards. Nice to take the time. It's also a double-edged sword, though, isn't it? Because you've really got to keep on top of your game. I think you're always better live. Like live is what I do best. I mean, the, the, the DVD is the best thing I've ever done, I think, uh, without any kind of question. I think I'm getting better at it as well, you know, from, from a low starting point, some might argue. But I'm a better comic than I was two years ago. Very kind of uptight, and there was no kind of gap in between. And now I'm just a little bit more relaxed. There's still as much material there, but I'm just a bit more relaxed. All right, let's take a piece of music, and we'll be back with our remaining moments with Jimmy Carr. 
We're back on your favourite local radio station with our remaining moments with Jimmy Carr. What does your mother... Our remaining moments seem to, it seems to suggest that things are going to take a turn for the worst here. Mm. Well, they are. These, these are the difficult questions. These are the okay, questions yeah, sure. where you might choose to just walk out. And at this point, I don't care because there's only a few minutes left. So okay, I can yeah, sure. with music. Nothing to Go lose. Right. This whole previous 40 minutes has been for nothing. It's just for these questions. I've see. enjoyed it. That's the important thing. Go on. Exactly. And so have I. But then again, I'm easily pleased. What did your mum and dad make of you? It's a weird thing because uh, I, I don't have parents. We'll move on from that question then. Oh, it's fine. I don't mind. Why? It's not. That's not bad. That's fine. You should keep that in because that's part of life too. It's, it's an awkward fine, question it? though. It doesn't sound very good when I ask that. It, it implies some form of vindictive questioning, doesn't it? No, I think that's absolutely fine. There's no problem with that. I think I, you know, I do genuinely think that's quite a valid thing to keep in because it's. I think sometimes you sort of feel like when you listen to things on the radio, or whatever, they're a bit sanitized, and people like I, you'd imagine that no one had ever died. People die all the time. People are estranged from people. It's fine. We've discussed your mum and dad. That didn't go down very well. That's uh, all right. At what point did you realise that this is not something that I'm just lucky at doing? This is a, a way of earning good money at it. I didn't start till I was 26. I started around the turn of the century, which I'm fond of saying because it sounds rather grand, doesn't it? <laughs> I started doing comedy at the turn of the century. You're in very safe hands here. <laughs> sounds, sounds all right, doesn't it? Sounds nice. What happened at 26 to make you the man you I was, I was working and I was a bit bored of my job and I thought I would give comedy a go and I was planning to do it as a hobby. I was planning to, you know, I thought I was a success when I was doing 10 minute gigs getting paid 30 quid. I thought that'll do. Fine, a couple of those a week keep my head above water everything else has been you know it's easy to sort of think that there's uh, an avaristic uh, uh, avaricious rather it's easy to think there's an avaricious kind of um, you know uh, barefaced ambition to me that I was always going to be on TV but of course I wasn't I just got lucky there can't be anything more terrifying although I know there is than standing on a stage and doing a gag and them just looking at you as if you've said nothing I, well firstly I, there are more terrifying things I got uh, chased by a shark once uh <laughs> Genuinely, I got chased by a shark. No one ever believes the story of me being chased by a shark because it's so implausible. I was in Key West and we were snorkeling and I got chased by a shark uh, and it was scary. The, the reason no one believes it is because that's basically the story. There's nothing... It feels like it should be a longer tale. Do you think it was your flapping hair that attracted him? Or? Could have been. It was pretty long at the time. Anyway, um, no, uh, yeah, there, there are... Um, do you know what? It tends not to happen. In a big venue, I tend to be telling jokes that I know are going to work. And in smaller rooms, it's more of a workshop feeling. And I think audiences really like it in a small room when you're trying out new stuff, when stuff doesn't work. Because it's like they're seeing behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. Oh, OK, this is how they get to where they're going. All right. What about in the beginning, though? Did you have those nights when you were either paid off or you just bombed? Um, not many, no. I mean, it's pretty... You, you would never get paid off. That would be a very old-school comic thing. Um, you'd always be on. And uh, in terms of dying, I've died a couple of times, but not many. Maybe Maybe twice. I don't know whether it's more awkward for the person watching or for the comedian, because you do sympathise at the same time as thinking you really are awful, you should find another job. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. Pretty bad. It doesn't happen that much. I mean, it's a really it's it's pretty rare. I mean, sometimes the open spots are, are awful. But more often than not, they're pretty good. Why do you work so hard with the tour? I notice every theatre I go in, no matter who I'm interviewing or whether I'm seeing a show, your poster's there on the wall, almost non-stop. Is that because you love it so much and you want to keep doing it, or is it just because you want the money? Um, it's a heady mix. No, it's a, uh, I do it because there's the opportunity there. I mean, I, I think I've got a, a weird for a, a lapsed Catholic, um, uh, like properly lapsed as well. Um, a weird to be, to have such a Protestant work ethic, but I like to work. I, I like to be out of the house and, and to, to be busy. I like thinking of jokes. I like telling jokes to people and it seems like a really easy, lovely job. You know, I only work maybe four nights a week. It's not that much. Your DVDs are very grand with the set and everything. Is it you with a mic turning up at a theatre or is it a big production with catering and all of that nonsense? Uh, it's about halfway between the two. I travel with a guy called Gav and we've got a projector and we play some sketches at the beginning of the show and then I come in and tell the jokes uh, and, you know, it's a pretty nice radio mic and we don't travel with a big set or whatever. We just use whatever's there. But, yeah, it's not, it's not a big production. We don't have catering vans, certainly. I just drive myself there. <laughs> and what about the loneliness? Because hotels are nice for about two days and then you want to just get home. Do you try and get home every night if you can? I've got sat-nav in the car, so that, that talks to me. It's like a conversation. <laughs> and, and most hotels these days have got, like, you know, they get the, they get the porn from the continent, so it's pretty decent. Mm. You know, I, I sleep in my bed most nights, you know, because it's... Unless I'm in Newcastle or, you know, Carlisle, really far north, I can drive home. I've got a carbon footprint like a Wookiee. <laughs> It is great to talk to you, and thank you for your time, because I know you're a very busy man, and you're very popular, and everybody seems to want you on, which is nice. It must be great to be in a position where you're asked to do chat shows and things, because you'll bring some life to it. Uh, do you know what? It's going to be It's going to be nice on the other side of it as well. It's going to be nice when you used to be that guy. <laughs> but you know what? I can, I can live with that. 
It's fine. Is there any dream left? Do you fancy going to New York and doing it over there, or is there anything? I've I've done a lot of stuff in the states. Um, I do the Tonight Show a couple of times a year, and Conan O'Brien a couple of times a year. That kind of just going on and doing five minute stand up. And I had a couple of series on Comedy Central. I've been very lucky in America, uh, but I don't spend an awful lot of time there. I like I like working here. I just think it's it's, it's nice to be in this country, and we're blessed with the best kind of um, circuit of theatres in in the world. I mean, I can't see why anyone would do an arena tour in the UK because there's just such wonderful theatres around the country in every town. It's wonderful. Um, so no, I'm kind of I'm sticking with it. I like it. You're such a, an animated performer, although your face doesn't necessarily tell the same story. Your words speak for themselves. But do you think your act would work in an arena? Because it's very different, isn't it, with the other type of comedy you do? Um, I, I don't know if it would, actually. I think the biggest room I play is about a 3,000-seater. But it's a good 3,000-seater. There's a weird kind of sense in which, when you travel around as many theatres as I do, you know what, a, like a good 1,000-seater is quite tight. The people are quite close to each other. It's amazing what a difference it makes if there's an extra half a foot on each seat. Like, I play a room in Edinburgh that's a lovely conference centre, and it fits about 1,200 people. And it's about the same size as the Hammersmith Apollo that fits 3,500 because the seats are that bit more comfortable and it's a bit more luxurious and they've got bigger aisles and whatever, whereas the uh, Hammersmith Apollo is a fire trap. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice, you know, to kind of play about a 3,000-seater. Everyone gets a good view. Over a certain number of seats, though, I insist on video cameras and screens because the experience for the audience, if you're right at the back, you can't see if I raise an eyebrow. And sometimes it's nice to be able to go, oh, yeah, now I'm watching him on the thing. I'm just going to, for the close-up bit, I'm going to watch the screen. It's nice to have that kind of thing. But, you know, if you go much bigger than that, you've got to be a performer like Lee Evans, who's just magnetic, huge screens, massive production, and he's dancing around the place. Or Bill Bailey. I haven't seen the show yet, but I'm going to go and see it. Um, I think that'll be good, because it's music. Music you can get away with a bigger venue. I think I saw you on Letterman, and it was interesting. The first couple of gags didn't get much, and then they got you, and I was nervous for you. It's often the way they, they tune into the accent. It takes them a while to go, oh, he's British. Oh, okay. Oh, these are jokes. He doesn't really mean that. Oh, my God. Do they really talk like that? That's exactly how they talk, yeah. I do. And Jay Leno is one of the friendliest men in show business. Like, he he took me out to a movie last time I saw him. We went to see a Terminator movie, and then he we went to his garage to hang out. How cool is that? So, are we ever going to Pretty cool. It's a little bit... Oh, clunk. Sorry, I've just dropped that <laughs> name. I'm sorry. I once had dinner with Sue Pollard. You once had dinner with Sue Pollard? Yeah, you've been to the cinema with Leno, one of the biggest stars in the world, and, you know, I know my place. Wow. What did you see? Doesn't matter. Come on, what did you see? Doesn't matter. Come on, tell me. Jimmy Carr, thank you very much for talking to me. Was it a romantic movie? What is the name of the DVD? Did you sit in one of the seats at the back? I can't remember the name of the DVD. Did you? What happened with Sue Pollard? What is the name of the DVD? The DVD? Mm. I forget. It's, um... Oh, anyway, it's in your stores. The thing that... It's I got Jimmy Carr on it. Thank you very much for your time. It's been lovely talking to you, I think. I, I like the way it's kind of petered out. I think that's good. A lot of people end on a high. Not here.